our second day in your, um, your borders, our conference, and I hope you're enjoying your time. Um, our first panel will be introduced uh, by my colleague Emma, so let's get started. Um, this panel is called uh, Egypt's Role in the Arab World, and we have two great panelists for today. We have um, Professor uh, Michael Bracey, who's a professor of Middle Eastern Studies um, at Oklahoma State University, and we also have Professor Abdullah uh, Fatan, who is a professor of political science at the American University of Cairo, and who is also the head of the International Relations Unit at Al Hamad. So, um, without further ado, each uh, panelist is going to give a short presentation, and then we're going to open uh, the floor for question and answer. So, uh, would you like to start, Dr. Pearson? Well, thank you all for inviting me and having me today, uh, particularly uh, to talk about uh, Egypt's role in the Arab world. Uh, I actually will do a lot of work on Palestinian national identity, particularly popular culture. So, I find myself other interests in the Arab world, particularly the U.S. interest, which I see at times to me almost an integral relationship, uh, and how that within Egypt, a whole series of not political movements, but I'd say pop culture, of entertainment, of film, and uh, uh, music, can either critique the success or the lack of success of that, uh, of that interaction. And I think that's important to do because it moves us beyond just looking at, say, uh, this more traditional scholarly analysis of national identity based on, say, Marxist, uh, of course, Marxist historiography on one hand, uh, or the interest of political economy on the other hand. Uh, for instance, most of the traditional scholarship looks at uh, Egypt really being isolated in the Arab world, particularly after 1979, the Camp David Accords. Uh, to be sure, immediately after uh, after that uh, seemingly retreat from uh, Nasser's leadership role in the Arab world, that uh, issue from the Khartoum uh, Conference, uh, solidarity and over political leadership, uh, that has uh, not been broken from that. But Egypt was so important economically that it couldn't be ignored. And even politically, it didn't seem to be engaged. Economically, it tended to be. Uh, quite engaged in the Arab world, I would say. In fact, within just a few years, particularly from the GCC countries, mostly Saudi Arabia, uh, as well as Jordan, the embargo that was put in place almost entirely collapsed. A, uh, UAE trade, in fact, rose from almost nothing uh, before Camp David to nearly $30 million by 1986. And Saudi exports, or I'm sorry, imports from Egypt increased from about $50 million in 1979 to over $80 million U.S. in 1985. So the exports to Egypt, in fact, also increased dramatically from only $40 million in 1979 to over $250 million by 84. And in the same year, trade with Kuwait had also risen from earlier declines to over $90 million. It seemed that only Libya and Syria were willing to stem the tide of trade and punish Egypt for this peace treaty with Israel. In fact, it's interesting to me because in the U.S., most no scholarship tends to focus on the dramatic rise in U.S. foreign aid to Egypt as a way to keep Egypt within the U.S. Uh, policies of the, of the Arab world uh, as being one of the most critical factors. When in reality, it was import trade to the GCC that one made the largest contingent of both foreign income in terms of trade, economic aid, and even remittances to Egypt from 1979 to 1996, with Western Europe actually coming in second in the U.S. Uh, uh, monetary uh, support a, uh, just a third, actually, that includes military, at least publicly, just where military spending. Uh, and of course, by 1989, Egypt was fully readmitted uh, to the Arab League. 
it tends to point to be that Egypt was just too large, too powerful economically and demographically to be ignored by the larger Arab world. Uh, to be sure, though, this trade was not, uh, and this investment was not integrated on an even basis. Certainly, oil investments, historically the largest of foreign investments in Egypt, continued to be dominated by the Western oil companies. Yet, economic structural reforms in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Israel continued to diversify Egyptian trades, uh, and in fact, uh, possibly uh, also leading to, by 1983, uh, over $500 million of weapon shipments uh, from Egypt to Iraq, which also might have played into the notion that Egypt no longer needed to compete with Israel uh, militarily to the toe. We could use some of that spending elsewhere. In fact, Egyptians seem to be spreading out across the uh, Arab world at this time uh, as remittances back to Egypt tended to also provide a failsafe for trading trends. Remittances, in fact, to Egypt, uh, to Egypt followed positive trends throughout the 1980s and 1990s. In fact, even up to this year, even when other countries suffered setbacks, uh, particularly after the first Gulf War in 1990-1991, the GCC states tended to punish uh, other Arab entities that had supported uh, or not, not opposed uh, American entry into that, uh, into that conflict. Particularly Palestinians, Jordanians, and Yemenis who were uh, expelled to the tune of almost 800,000. And to make up for that massive labor shortage, Egypt easily stepped in. Uh, in fact, the oil industry, even in Egypt, also tended to open up not just to the larger Arab world uh, after 1979, but even to Israel itself. In fact, right after uh, uh, the Camp David Accords, Egypt supplied 22% of Israel's import needs in terms of oil between 1982 and 1984. It's, and by the end of the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, those oil exports increased to make up nearly 43% of Israel's oil import needs. It seemed to me that then Camp David didn't isolate Egypt at all from the larger Arab world, but rather intimately integrated uh, although at an uneven distribution of wealth back in Egypt. And that was actually my first experience when I arrived in Cairo in 1996, uh, much of which uh, actually revolved around going to see a blockbuster film at the time, a historical reenactment uh, uh, the Nasser period, a movie called Nasser 56. It's supposed to have been 100 days to change the world movie set uh, or begins on June 18, 1956, evacuation day, with depictions of Nasser taking down the Union Jack and ending 74 years of occupation, only of course to see the Suez Canal still functioning under foreign administration. It ends on November 2nd, the film does, 1956, with bombs falling all around Egypt, Nasser mounted the pulpit at Al-Azhar, and in a great moment of Egyptian unity and leadership amongst the Arab world, declare that Egypt will fight on. They will never, never submit. The film was shot in this almost classic black and white uh, documentary feel, and was punctuated with footage uh, and of long forgotten nationalist themes. But the real importance of that film in 1996 was not Nasser of 1956, but possibly Egypt of 1996. As all good historians will point out, historical films are far less about the past, far more about the present. As a genre, according to one Indian scholar, the impersonization built into the very identity codes and historical films produced a rich source of knowledge into the way that society constructs its self-image by projecting onto the past imperatives of the present and vice versa. Therefore, it must maintain that the weighty events of the present are the true measure of a historical film. This film, in fact, was the brainchild of Mohammed Fando and star of the up-and-coming pop singer 